Welcome to today's edition of Daytime Dialogues. It's actually our 50th show. We began this when everyone knows what began, and we've had the opportunity to continue it with some of the more fascinating uh, guests over these months and months. And it is my true pleasure to welcome today, Rabbi Zev Elif. Rabbi Elif, many of us in Chicago know very well because he's one of our own. He's the vice provost of Toro College, Illinois, the chief academic officer of Hebrew Theological College, formerly known as the Yeshiva. And he's also a significant scholar of American Jewish history and history in general, but having earned his doctorate in American Jewish history at Brandeis, a master of arts in history and education at Teachers College. And I think one of the proud proudest accomplishments is Smicha at Yeshiv University, where he is a Talmud of Rav Shechter and many of the other great Rosh Yeshivas there. So Rabbi Elif, thank you so much for joining me. Well, my, my high school diploma has your signature on it. Yes, I know. Mm -hmm. I know I wasn't going to push my luck. <laughs> uh, very proud class of 2003, yeah. Well, it's great to have you. And thank you so much for, uh, for letting me spend this time with you today. I really want to jump into it. You know, for those of us who know Rabbi Elif, we know that he is a prolific writer. Um, I think one of the best ways of trying to find the list of books is I went on Amazon and all of a sudden a whole page is filled with Zev Elif's books. But one of them I want to start with is the one I believe was based off of your dissertation, which I enjoyed, the one called Who Rules the Synagogue? It's a more scholarly piece than some people may be um, familiar with, but it's a very significant piece. And uh, it talks about the shift of, of the leadership of synagogues from the lay leader and to the rabbinic leadership. And it was taking place in the early part of, you know, of America itself. I'm wondering, it, today it looks like it's going the other way around. Uh, in so many ways, it seems like if I look in Chicago, shuls keep on popping up, not because rabbis want to start shuls, but because Balabatim want to start shuls and they find their rabbi. And synagogue roles seem to be shifting in many ways. I'm just wondering what your take is on, on this. Well, well, that trend, as I observe it, is in the Orthodox community. The opposite is happening. There's a coalescence in the more liberal streams of Judaism and reform and conservative. There's a collapsing in which five congregations are moving into one, very similar to how in the west side of Chicago, um, congregations collapsed, not, not five, but um, I think you sure, uh, a little bit north of you, is, um, is I think has the moniker of three or four, maybe five different shuls in one. Well, KNS is three. Right. He started out as Congregation of West Rogers Park. Rabbi Levy was the founder of the shul, and we merged with the Sephardish shul, Knesset Yisrael, Yisrael Nusach Spard, and not everyone knows where the kins comes from, and we became KNS of West Rogers Park. The, so I would suggest that, I agree with you, but that's where Orthodox Judaism is moving contrary to the stream of, I would say, American religion, in which you have um, denominationalism, is being burned has throughout the 20th century. There's now liberal Christianity and, uh, and in the Orthodox right. Uh, even sometimes Catholicism isn't separated from Protestantism. Um, and, and so much of my work is to situate uh, American Jewish history into American religious context. Um, is, so I would say that is what's, what you're noticing, which I think is, is, is quite astute, um, is that there's an impulse in the Orthodox community to create what, what I would uh, carefully call a boutiqueism, where whereas everyone else would like to blur distinctions. Um, and this is happening on the school level, on the school level, on the camping level, um, in which we want to code ourselves and to signal to others that this is who we are and how we are, and creating a shul is perhaps an easier way to telegraph where I belong within the swath of, of American orthodoxy. Interesting. And in that sense, you know, I, I was speaking with a conservative rabbi yesterday, uh, and I asked him about how he was, how the reopening was coming. Um, a very large, prominent conservative synagogue. Um, he told me that, um, Pesach, 
they began to allow up to 50 people in their sanctuary, which seats 500, that they never reached that number, even on Yisker, where they had opened up their early morning Yisker versus the main, one of them had only 15 people come. And I'm imagining that while it's true that, that, in the, you know, that there is these mergers taking place in conservative reform, and we see it in Chicago as well, there's only a few conservative synagogues that are still growing or at least holding their own in, in the Chicago area. I'm wondering, you know, now post COVID, when people um, in the non-Orthodox community can access religion and much from their living room couch, uh, are we gonna see even a further, is that gonna accelerate? Accelerate how we have, have decoupled ritual or synagogue Judaism from everything else? Right, yeah. You know, I think that was already happening. It'll accelerate, but you notice how people acquire. I, I have to think really hard about this just because I'm a professional Jew. I'm paid for being a Jew. Um, and um, this is actually very similar to the previous question, which is when, when you're a a teacher or a pulpit rabbi, you're thinking very hard about your Jewish identity and how you're signaling and people know about it. Rabbi Mutanki, you deliver a drasha ad hayom every single week, if not more frequently. Um, and so you're careful uh, with how you project your professional and personal identity, the same way that I might be in, in writing, um, in a way that a lay person cannot. And so I think what you're suggesting is actually both sides of it, is that the, the tendency to open up new shuls is the way for lay leaders to signal their own identity, different than a 15-minute trasha. And with what you're pointing out about what, what COVID has done to the American Jewish community is that whereas it may be in 2018, which now seems like 20 years ago, um, they did so many people did their Jewishness on Facebook, on Twitter. It's now happening even more. And um, they tell me that the hit click on, uh, on Safari yeah, is just um, um, ultra magnified. Uh, that's where people are acquiring, acquiring their Jewish texts. Um, uh, so much of uh, uh, the, the tendency to move to these, uh, to, to watch these videos. Um, that, that's really happening. And where, that's why I said now there's so many articles about what it's gonna look like and nobody knows. Um, and I think you're right. I think it's, uh, it's accelerated uh, two or threefold. And, and to move then just in a little bit of a different direction in terms of one of your other passions, uh, the question of the past, present and future of what is called the modern Orthodox community, which um, I've heard you speak about that modern Orthodox community is also just the term modern Orthodox is very controversial um, and, and no one knows. I've taught classes on this and, and I've asked kids to define what modern Orthodox means. And typically the first answer that they give is some variation on Orthodoxy light, um, yeah. which is just demoralizing. Uh, even though they may not, they might may not subscribe to that approach, but that's the, sometimes they see our community, and I include you. Obviously, is an important part of our community. Um, is, uh, is has shifted and has changed, as you mentioned before about other religious denominations. We've shifted somewhat to the right, but so has have other religious denominations shifted to the right. Um, where do you think we're headed in the next decade? So what is really interesting about the question, I think I think that the modern Orthodox community has not adjusted to where we fit in the uh, geographic and demographic landscape. When that term was coined in the late 1960s and when it uh, flourished in the 70s and the early 80s, it meant the mainstream, the majority of the American Orthodox Jewish community. Now, according to the Pew study of 2013, it represents 30% of self-described Orthodox Jews, meaning that when the Pew Research Center interrogated 
uh, their interviewees and they said, how do you identify reform conservative Orthodox? And the interviewee said, oh, I'm an Orthodox Jew. The script for the interview then prompted the interviewer to ask a follow-up question of, oh, are you yeshivish, Hasidic, or modern Orthodox? And only three out of 10 of people queried responded, oh, I am a modern Orthodox Jew. And our community hasn't adjusted to the fact that we're a minority of a minority of a minority. We might. Yeah, yeah but, but, but okay, and I agree with you, uh, despite the fact that that very same Pew um, study also talked about the, the inherent power, maybe, you know, not representative of our sides, but the power, the affluence, the influence that the, that, that minority within a minority with a minority has. So it may be that we're not used to being a minority, but we're still- We punch above that. our weight class. There's no question about it. Um, we're overrepresented in certain spaces, uh, but we also understand I, one person uncharitably introduced me one time when I was speaking on the topic as I wrote the eulogy for modern orthodoxy. It was hard to uh, revitalize after, uh, after that comment. Uh, I tried to persevere. Um, I think that once we come to terms with the fact that we're not a growing community, um, I think that first of all, leadership bottom up and top down needs to uh, define the term. And it's a, it's a slippery term. What does it mean? Um, at one point it meant it, what signaled my mind, a willingness uh, to uh, uh, engage the humanities and um, higher rungs of higher education. It's not so anymore. And that's not a, a Jewish thing or an Orthodox thing. It's an American thing. Uh, these philosophy departments, history departments are on, the, are on a sweep decline. Um, and so I think we need to fill what modern Orthodoxy means with renewed meaning. I think that's what young people are looking for is that you, you mom and dad, that's how we identify. Well, what does, what does that mean? Um, I think that's a step in the right direction. I think that this, is, and maybe co so much has happened in the last 2020, 2021 doesn't look much different. Um, I, I think that this is a, a time that we can seize that moment and, and have a, maybe a more meaningful conversation about what it means and all the different stakeholders. And I think that, that it ought to happen. So let's assume for a moment that occurs. But of course, it's not going to occur down, down. It's going to be more of a bottom-up kind of approach, just the nature of religion in, in the Jewish world. Do you think there is space, room for a growing modern orthodoxy? I think that it is a modern orthodoxy, which is porous, um, one that recognizes, and this is the issue of being a minority, um, mm -hmm. is that one needs to have um, connector devices to the broader Orthodox community. One of the reasons why Rabbi Emanuel Rackman had one no business of, he was supposed to be the so-called leader, said the sociologist Charles Liebman of modern Orthodoxy. He wrote an article immediately and said, no, no, I'm not. I have no interest, good or bad, uh, notwithstanding. I have no interest in being called modern Orthodox Jew because that's, uh, that's a subset of a subset. I'd rather be a part of the larger community. Again, Rabbi Rackman's politics and his theology aside, but that I, I think that what he's suggesting resonates right now in which um, we cannot exist in, in total isolation the way that some leaders wanted in the 60s and 70s, just the numbers don't make sense. And I think part of, the one, part of the piece that we need to embrace is the fact that we can still bridge communities easier without the same complications as other segments. And, but also that puts us in a really hard position. Um, for instance, politics, American politics, more divisive than ever. Um, I would suspect that the modern Orthodox community can extend itself to multiple camps, multiple camps that want to have nothing to do with one another, but they could be a bridge group that's absolutely certain, but it, it creates um, challenges in having, in, in communicating. I think that when it comes to engaging conversation in, um, in the non-Orthodox, it's a funny term, non-Orthodox, to describe 90% of the American Jewish world as non. Um, isn't, it, it, it more, isn't it more like about 85? 
it's growing, um, just the, the birth rate number, certainly. Um, I think that puts the modern Orthodox population in a very helpful position. And to uh, see, uh, you know, there's a, um, there's a text in, in the Chamesh Trashot, in which Rabbi Soloveitchik talks about the Na'ar, that, um, that I and the boy will go up, you, Yishmael, stay behind. I don't know who it is, um, both of them. Um, I think that might be a charge for the modern Orthodox community. Uh, we're in a very unique and helpful, positively helpful space to have multiple conversations. But it also means that um, internally, it, it's messy. Good, everything is messy. Uh, that's why my book about authenticity, about authentically orthodox, is all about the messiness of what is authentic and what isn't, what we call authentic. Um, I think I'll say another, another item, which is for years, the orthodox community has committed philanthropically and educationally to outreach. Uh, I've always thought that we needed more inreach. Uh, and when young boys and girls say, what is modern orthodox, it means we need to have more inreach. No, it's... It's interesting, you know, we've done some studies at your alma mater of Ida Crown in terms of um, the, the behaviors of, of alumni 10 years out. And uh, what we have discovered is that the overwhelming majority, it was over 80%, viewed themselves as, as, as observant or more observant than their parents. Um, that there is something good happening and something right happening. I, I think there's also a sense of, of being in the minority that people have adopted as opposed to being, as opposed to a pride in who we are. Part of the challenges of being uh, an older movement in a sense, because I don't think Haredism wasn't the same kind of movement. It's actually newer than modern orthodoxy in America. You know, I, when I teach Orthodox Judaism, I teach a survey, which is usually a dual credit course with the Fast Mishra of a high school. Um, so much of how we talk about religion is not put into historical context. Um, so much of what we talk about around the Shabbos table, because we can't Google it uh, at the moment, um, is um, not anchored. No, not uh, that you could challenge what is objectivity in, in history, and certainly there are multiple interpretations. Um, but I find what's so valuable, particularly for the high school cohort, usually um, mostly 12th and 11th graders, is that to look at the text and to understand that trajectory and to come, they're, they're smart people. Uh, young people have greater access to the world than ever before. And so we're, uh, you know, they're able to negotiate um, co complicated conversations around LeBron James versus Michael Jordan. The answer, of course, is Michael Jordan. Um, and to understand what's wrong with batters one through six in, with the Chicago Cubs this year in music stylings, we ought to trust that they can have significant and substantive conversations around religion. And I find history, and you can do it other ways, um, I find history to be very useful building blocks to have a conversation. Um, I, this happens when I teach my undergrad survey at Blitzen Institute. Um, and it, it's non-confrontational in that way. And when, I think so much of my writing is to put out material just to have a more constructive and helpful conversation. So you are the chief academic officer of, of Hebrew Theological College. If you had a magic wand and you had an opportunity to to change the education, whether it's leading up to or at, what are the big, what are the big picture items that you would want to have the Jewish community do differently? I think as so I would have a charge for teachers and for administration. For administration, I would, and it's a losing battle. I would, I would like educational outcomes, for example. Um, in, our, in the mission of Fassman Yeshiva High School. I'm contractually obligated to pronounce it Yeshiva. Uh -huh. um, I did notice that and I'm proud of you. <laughs> we, we, and I think we do a good job of it. I believe we do. Of Mido Tobo or Midos Tobos. I sincerely believe that graduates from the Yeshiva are, real, are mentioned. But I would love to be able to measure that and to know in what spaces are we doing an exemplary job and when are we doing one step maybe below 
exemplary. And if we say that's what we do, I want to know, I want to assess how we do that. And I want to use room for, I want, I want to close the loop and improve in the curriculum. And I think that the, the day school community ought to believe in their project. We have to do this on a higher ed, always look at assessment and understand. We, we owe that to our stakeholders, any high school of higher education to do this. I would love for the day schools and camping, I'd like to measure um, synagogue membership with meaning making metrics. So I'm never gonna win that one. But I would love to be able to, how is that we do what we do? And what, how do we do that? All anchored within the mission. That's one thing. Um, for teachers, it's, bor it's boring, but, and this is where my entire Satov to the academy surely comes through is, I can read Hebrew. I can he read Hebrew there. I can read Hebrew faster than I can read English sometimes. Um, I think that we need to get the best of text. And so many of our young people are afraid because they don't have the felicity of language. And I, I think that comes from a, a time in which a parent body was less culturally and literally literate. And now that's not the case. Um, and then in terms of the day school community generally, um, now, I would actually say this is a little different. Um, I want to know with the year in Israel, I am a first generation uh, Shana Aleph, Shana Bet student. My parents didn't have the luxury of, of attending the Shiva Seminary in Israel, but my children are going to be second generation. We now, some, on some occasions, we have third, probably not fourth generation yet. How does that experience look differently? It cost me 33 cents to call my friends and 55 cents to call America when I was in year in Israel. Now you can do it on WhatsApp for free. Uh, how does that change the year, our expectations of the year in Israel, both in terms of day schools leading toward it, but also whether it's YU, Lander, HTC, or JLIC on a, on a, on a campus other than those three? Um, what are our expectations of how we leverage that, that, that awesome year or two or three? That, that latter point is the more complicated of all three, believe it or not, having spent the better part of a decade trying to bring together some of the Israel schools and say, okay, what do you want from the high schools so that you have a prepared student as opposed to say, just send us whatever you have because whatever you have doesn't matter. Um, and what do you plan on, what's your output? The input and the output is very complicated because there we're dealing with multiple independent institutions, which it's a, a marketplace. And so the marketing and the, uh, is really what will drive pieces, which is also a conversation I had earlier today that points to your second point. It was a question about, I, I still teach my Gemara share in Ivrit, but I'm the only, the only Gemara share that's still taught in Ivrit. When I was in the yeshiva, my Gemara share was in Ivrit. Rav Hirschler Zetzal, he taught in Ivrit. There was no, no two ways around it. And we all were able to participate. Um, I, there aren't enough educators today, which is the fault of the programs in Israel that allow students to go to Israel for a year and be immersed in English language. High level thinking, but English language as well. Mm -hmm. But in terms, of, in terms of, for example, going back to your point about the demise of the study of the humanities, uh, something that was pointed out, I think last year, or the year before was the first year that Sai Sims had more students than Yeshiva College did. Um, do you, do you see a way to shift that? Or is that just going to be the reality that we're going to deal with? Well, my colleagues in Jewish studies departments, for example, at, at um, secular universities, um, they will constantly be developing partnerships with other, with other departments to make sure that their courses are co-listed as part of the core curriculum because sure. they want attendance. Um, and that's just Jewish studies, let alone the humanities. I'm sure it's happening with there as well. I, I think we have to make it more compelling. Um, I was reading, it was probably why I subliminally suggested Michael Jordan. There's a wonderful literature 
um, about Michael Jordan's retirement in terms of what it means for American culture in the early 90s and Ronald Reagan. I don't have, I don't teach the course to engage in with students in that text, but maybe I should fashion one. Um, I think that we have to think hard about the materials that we're teaching. Um, there's a wonderful scholar at Stanford named Sam Weinberg who wrote a book, I think I'm paraphrasing it, but not by much. Why do I need to know anything when everything is already available on my smartphone? It's a wonderful book, a collection of essays that he's, he's written a lot of wonderful books um, uh, on the subject, is that we also have to challenge the uh, students to think with a critical mind. Um, providing facts, one need not know that Rambam lived uh, from 1138 to 1204. Nobody needs to know 1040 to 1105 are the dates of Rashi and he had two daughters, not three most likely. You can Google that. What do I do with that information? The same way that um, nobody needs to know what, um, you know, how many home runs Babe Ruth hit or what, when, when did the British invasion begin? You can Google it. What do you do with that information? I think the humanities for, on the college level, but even on the, on, on the secondary and primary school level, we need to show what's compelling about these materials and why it's meaningful. And, you know, Rev Lichtenstein in one of his essays talked about people who go to business school is no different than training plumbers. Uh, when it was part of his plea of, of building up the humanities and creating the, or, or preserving the higher culture which I think is one of the great challenges we have. We just have a few more minutes and I just, uh, I just wanna ask you a question that I think everyone wants to know who knows you. How do you put out so much material? Mavis Beacon teaches typing. <laughs> uh, no, in, in, um, I, I do type very quickly. Uh, I always, uh, the personal questions are the hardest, um, but this was an, this is an easy one. I was blessed with the most marvelous teachers. Um, as um, I remember when Rav Shachler visited Yeshiva, I, I knew I needed to attend that year. I remember when, uh, when I attended an honors course at Yeshiva College taught by Rabbi uh, Jacob J, Rabbi J.J. Schachter. And, and he's a teacher for life. And then in graduate school with Jonathan Sarna, they all happened. I would. I think there's something about the surname being left, beginning with letter S, apparently. Um, but I've had just the most wonderful teachers, colleagues, and um, I'll, maybe this is uh, to your other point. I remember when I was admitted into graduate school, and I was admitted before the summer began, and I asked Dr. Sarna very politely, "I have three months." Uh, at the time, I had a Wexner uh, grant to, uh, to pay the rent. Uh, what, uh, what should I do over the summer? He told me in no uncertain terms that the publications of the American Jewish Historical Society, we now call the Journal of American Jewish History, begins in 1893, start reading. I showed up to Waltham, Massachusetts uh, for orientation, and I told Dr. Sarna, with ho hopefully not too much bravado, I said, I can't promise that I read every single article, but I opened up every issue and I read something. He said, okay, the Journal of American Jewish Archives began in 1948, start reading. Um, when you have the keys, uh, then things start to fall into place, but it's really, I, I'm so blessed. Uh, and I would uh, still to this day, I from my teachers at the academy, moved, part, part of what the fun thing of moving to Chicago was that I get to re-engage them, still call them by their last name. Um, and, um, and my car the talk to, to my teachers. And, and for me personally, that's always a challenge to be a, a, a decent teacher is because I know what a good one looks like. Well, and on that, that's the perfect note to, to end on because uh, Rabbi Elif, your teaching has become something that we have grown accustomed to in Chicago because it's prolific as soon as you're writing and it's engaging and it's wonderful. And I thank you for joining us for this half hour. And I look forward to your continued contributions to our community, uh, to the knowledge base of World Jewelry. What's your next book coming out? What is it on? It's under review. First of all, Rabbi Matanki, so much of it was facilitated by you. So my gratitude, it goes both directions. My next book is under review. It is a history of a Jewish football player named Arnie Harween at Harvard, 
Um, he's he's Hank Greenberg before Hank. Actually, when he retires, that's when there's a notice that the Detroit Tigers have brought up uh, Hank Greenberg. So it works out quite seamlessly. But it's about anti-Semitism and American tolerance at Harvard in the 1920s. Sounds fascinating. I'm looking forward to, to adding it to my collection of the Ellipse. The Chicago. He lived. Um, West Side. Harvey Leather Company is still here. Really? It's on Goose Island. Yeah. Okay. So now we know. <laughs> it's going to be great. Thank you again, and have a wonderful day, Rabbi. I appreciate so your much time. Thank you. Thanks so much for having me. Take care.